Hello, I'm Dr. Marla Shapiro, past president of the North American Menopause Society and sit on the board of trustees. And I'm joined by our incoming and current president of the North American Menopause Society, Dr. James Liu. Tell everybody who you are and what you do. Well, I'm a reproductive endocrinologist and uh, I work with hormones uh, primarily in reproductive age and menopausal women. So when we think about perimenopausal women, menopausal women, they're becoming more aware of the fact that bone health is critical and often thought of as a silent disease. We have tools to screen. Let's talk about first what a bone density test measures. Well, the bone density test is a low density, low power x-ray that looks at the mineral content in a woman's uh, spine and her hip area. And? And it is uh, used to predict the amount of calcium in the bone, which gives it strength. So it's a uh, rough indicator of fracture risk. So as a healthcare provider, we're often barraged by women of all ages that want to have a bone density test. It's, it's not a high risk test. It's, it's not difficult. Who should have a bone density and when do we as healthcare providers say, no, you really don't require one? Okay, so there's, there's some recommendations for who should get bone density testing. Uh, in general, for women that are healthy, uh, age 65 and older should get a bone density test as a baseline. And generally the test isn't done every year. It's usually, if there is a problem, done every other year because there are some uh, minor variations from test to test. And so in order to see a change, oftentimes you have to do two tests uh, over a two year period of time. As a healthcare provider, the facility that you're sending a patient to, one, does that matter? And two, is it important to make sure that second test is done at the exact same bone facility? It's important to have it done at the same facility. Uh, the facilities can vary. Many are located in radiology departments. Some are located with uh, kidney specialists some with endocrine specialists, uh, but it is an office, almost an office-based test, so it can be uh, done in the office, and the machine is relatively uh, in, uh, inexpensive in terms of the, the actual machine and the testing itself. But if you do one in this office and then you go do one in the other office, can there be variability based on the precision of the machine itself? Definitely, and uh, even though there are standard things that they do to try and calibrate the machines, there are differences uh, even with the same company making the same type of machine. So if we look at women under the age of 65 now who are coming in and asking for a bone density test, is there a guideline that helps us decide who, let's say over the age of 50, but under the age of 65, might benefit from a bone density test, recognizing that most of these women typically are not at high risk for fracture? So there are some historical things that you can use uh, as additional criteria. One would be a woman who has had a low trauma fracture, that is she doesn't fall from a, a big height, maybe she was kicking a soccer ball and all of a sudden had a, a, a fracture in her foot. Uh, a woman who is on uh, a variety of uh, steroids, like women with rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, uh, the steroids would be prednisone or uh, cortisone acetate or any of those things. Those women are at particular risk. Women that are low body weight, those individuals uh, that uh, are have an eating disorder and have had a past history of very low body weight, have a lower bone mass to begin with and they are at risk. Young women now who are put on, for example, some of the newer aromatase inhibitors well under the age of 65, what do we do with these women in terms of thinking about bone densities? So. Aromatase inhibitors prevent the production of estrogen very effectively and obviously used for breast cancer patients as a long-term therapy for up to five years. And in these women, the bone loss is significant. And the problem is that it is silent, so it's unknown. Uh, obviously, we can treat these individuals to preserve their bone with non-estrogen containing compounds. So it would not impact on their prognosis for breast cancer. In terms of bone density, doing the hip and the back, what other sites? Why is it that we don't do the wrist or we don't do any other bone sites? Well, the, the weight-bearing regions are the most predictive in terms of fracture risk. Uh, there are some 
uh, studies that show that the forearm may be predictive, but that's an alternative site. So for someone who may have had, let's say, uh, rods put in their back where you can't do a spine density accurately or have had a hip replacement or any of those things, then a surrogate site would be the forearm. Now, as many of us get older, we develop arthritis in our back and we get a false elevation in that bone density. And the bone density then doesn't necessarily predict fracture risk or tell us anything about bone quality. Is there a time where someone as a healthcare provider should say, well, you know, this, the bone density really isn't offering me any more information? Yeah, generally the, the back gets less and less accurate as a predictor for vertebral fractures as you get older because of this condition, usually spondylosis or uh, prior uh, uh, changes in the back from osteophytes. Uh, and so that artificially elevates the bone density. Uh, the hip then would be the better site in terms of prediction for fracture risk. And, and the hip itself uh, is not prone to as many uh, false uh, elevations as the spine. Future directions for measuring bone quality, because the bone density doesn't tell us anything about bone quality. We have all, as practitioners seen so-called normal bone densities, low risk for fracture bone densities, and then someone fractures. Where, where do you think we're going with that? What's going to help us interpret some of the tests that we do? There are research tests that predict bone strength, and they generally deal with 3D uh, enhanced uh, at the, almost the microscopic level. Uh, because it, the strength is really due to the connectivity of the protein matrix rather than just the calcium alone. So the calcium is really a surrogate marker. Uh, and so the really the connection between the sort of the girders in the bone is what really determines bone strength. And so we do have the ability to do that, but that requires a very expensive and much higher doses of radiation. So not ready be appropriate. For, not ready for prime time. Not appropriate for a screening test. Not ready for prime time. And um, overall, in terms of the role of bone density in assessing fracture risk, what else should healthcare practitioners be looking look at? You know, you've got that bone density result. Is it the only thing that we look at, or what helps guide us in our interpretation of, res of a result that we get? So there are standard uh, tables for race, sex, uh, and so we can look at a scoring system. Uh, the one that uh, we use commonly is the T-score, which is a, um, a statistical standard deviation from the normal based on your age uh, and your gender and your uh, race. So there are specific tables that have been generated for what would be normal and what would be abnormal. And uh, it's classified into low bone mass or com less commonly called now osteopenia and osteoporosis, which is two and a half standard deviations from the normal range. And so that's a very important component of predicting fracture risk. Yet important for young, healthy women to know that just that minus 2.5, what we now call an osteoporosis, may not be a threshold to treat. That's correct. And there are uh, what we call uh, intent to treat tables that we look at to look at the age and the changes in the T-score to predict which women would benefit from uh, bone sparing type treatments. Do you think that it's really important for us as healthcare practitioners to recognize the fact that this may be an important baseline screening test in part of what we routinely do because we often think about how often we're doing our pap tests and our mammograms, often bone density, important to think about? It is important to think about and oftentimes uh, when a woman visits the primary care physician, because she's, by that age, maybe transitioning to a primary care physician rather than her OBGYN. And so oftentimes this is one of the things that is not uh, mentioned in, in their screening or their annual exam. Obviously, you don't want to be doing this every year, but I think a baseline set point should be done at some point uh, if she is at high risk uh, after the age of 50, or if she is at uh, relatively normal risk at 65. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you.